iFanboy at New York Comic Con 2012 is brought to you by Seagate. I'm here with Scott Snyder at the DC booth. You have had quite a year. I have, man. I'm very lucky. Um, I guess the big the big announcement is that you're going to be doing Superman with Jim Lee. Where where did this come from? Batman and Superman. You got all the keys. I know. I just I sold my soul to the devil. I think, or somebody else's, maybe in a past life, and just got these things. But no, it was a. Uh, to be clear, like um, I met with Dan DiDio about maybe nine or ten months ago. And he was saying, you know, if you want with Batman, when you, if you have time, are there other superheroes you want to work on? And I was like, well, I have this Superman story in my head that I've been thinking about forever that, that I'd love to do at some point. And he mentioned that there might be an opportunity in the spring, or I mean, sorry, in the, in the fall to start working on something with someone and to launch a new book. And so he and I started talking and I, and I developed the story and pitched it. And it really is kind of like the Superman story I would write if I only ever got one chance to write the character. I always assume I'm going to get, like, booted the hell off the character at the end. Like, I think you're good now. Well, I don't know. I'm, like, I'm introducing maybe Batman's brother and then be like, you're out of here, kid. You know, so, like, with this one, it's the same, where it's like, this is everything I love about Superman, everything I care about about the character. It's a standalone story, uh, arc within an ongoing series in continuity. So it will happen alongside the other books, but I want it to be, like, our opus, me and Jim, about Superman. Like, you're going to see him in new situations, new villains. You'll see all your favorite casts. I'm writing the features, and I'm writing the backups. The backups are going to be really intimate portraits of key Superman characters. And that he's going to be fighting a new villain that really kind of shakes him to his core, the way the Court of Owls did for Batman. And I couldn't be more excited about it, man. Jim is bringing his, his A-plus game to this thing. And, you know, I'm giving it everything I got. So we really hope you guys like it. What uh, what's your take on on Superman? I mean, everybody sort of has their their way they look at it. Whether it's you know the alien among men or, or whichever, like how does it you see Superman? That's a great question. I mean, the way, only way to approach these characters, I feel like, is to essentially find because you know you love them from go, but it's more about finding what you relate to at that moment in the character and what you find most exciting and frightening about the character. And so, for Batman and Joker, it really was like. Joe, Batman has accumulated this family around him, and as a father of young children, I think to myself how scary the world is. And, of course, the Joker is the villain who will say, don't you wish they were all dead and we could go back to being you and me? And so for Superman, it was similar where I had to find the thing that excited me. And what that is really is I love that Superman is the most powerful being in the universe, uh, you know, superhero and sort of that we know of on Earth. And yet at the same time, a lot of what his, um, his heroism is about is restraint. So this sense of Superman could reshape the world and make it anything he wanted to based on what he thinks it should be, but he, instead he challenges us to do it ourselves, and he does the right thing, which is he's inspired by humanity, and he challenges us to aspire, essentially. And in that way, he also becomes unpopular at times, and he's also alien for that, meaning I'm not really as interested in him being an outcast because he's an alien, literally but an outcast in this story because he does the right thing when it's hard to do and it puts him in the position of being an enemy of the government of of the you know of popular opinion this is not the frank miller version no it's not <laughs> it's not at all but but that vi the version actually in that story in dark knight returns is one of my favorite iterations that what um, what's so funny about true justice in the american way all of that stuff is in the dna of this about why is superman relevant can we take him and say, Superman, you're nothing, you don't mean anything, and shake him down to his very foundation so that when he comes back fighting, it's going to be the biggest, most epic battle you've seen in a long time with him? When you're, when you're working on a character like this, and I, I, you've got experience with it with Batman, but you know, when Superman does something, it's one of those things that, like when, when he said, oh, I'm not American, I'm, I'm here for the world or whatever, like the news, the whole world kind of picks it up. Yeah. It's like, is that in the back of your mind? Like if I do this, it's, it's going to get attention both negative and otherwise, which I guess is what Superman's doing. Yeah, it does. It really is, you know. But at the end of the day, the only way to sort of not be paralyzed by that is to imagine that you made him up in some way because, you know, otherwise you do these versions that are derivative. And I fell into that on Batman at first, like when I was writing Dick Grayson, before I really got the pages that would become Detective, I did so many drafts where I was like, I'm going to write like Pete Tomasi's version of him. I'm going to write like, you know, uh, Chuck Dixon's version of Dick Grayson. And what you realize is you have to be able to say, this is my version. I know it's in the public eye, but I'm going to pretend it's not. I'm just going to write the fan fiction or the most, the, the absolute story I would write if I, nobody was reading it and, and, and be fearless, hopefully, in that regard. And so even though there's this giant spotlight and stage, I try and pretend that it's not. Although he has some lines that I know might 
He, we're trying to make him. I want him to be a little bit more dangerous and a little bit more sort of you know brash about things. Where he is, he is kind of fighting for his life in this thing in a lot of ways, but also fighting for what he stands for, mm -hmm. and and under a lot of a lot of antagonism from forces that are much more powerful than him. Right. So you know he's he's Superman a little bit unleashed. You know. That sounds like a lot of stuff that'll be fun, and you've got a good track record, so I think it'll be all right. I, 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 listen, I think you're going to be okay. Thank you. I, it means a lot, dude. Yeah. Josh, seriously. Um, I appreciate that. Now let's go over to, to Batman, and, um, uh, you know, you've had a hell of a good run on it. Where, like, where are you in the, in the arc of, of sort of, of your, your take on Batman? Are you going to keep doing this for... You know the foreseeable future. Do you feel like you've got a lot left in front of you? You, you, you know. Yeah, I mean, we really do. I want to make it really clear. Like, we're not going anywhere. Me and Greg, we're signed on for a long time. And the next big arc we're doing, we're doing this Joker arc. We're crazy proud of right now. And then after that, we're really going to do an earlier story. You know, we're going to go back to some of the stuff we started in issue zero. And from there, we have one more big story plan. But all of that's going to carry us all the way through the end of 2013, the beginning of 2014. And, you know, I guess I sort of approach it like each story is almost a novel about the character that Greg and I do together. So the stories are very big, you know. You're into Joker, a long arc. Yeah, yeah, each one is long. Each one is big, you know, with little things in between. But for the most part, we have at least a few more big stories planned for you guys. So we're really excited. And I I love commuting, dude, from, from like, doing Gotham and being in Gotham and then being like, I'm going to go to Metropolis yeah. today and then go over there. It's, like, the strangest thing to go from this dark city to the bright city. But... What I love writing about with these characters is you try and find the thing that you think is most heroic about them, and in that thing is also usually their greatest flaw. You know, for Batman and Court of Owls, it's sort of this notion that he knows the city better than anybody. You look at it and you're like, that's so heroic and wonderful that he devotes himself to that, but it's also impossible. The same with Superman here, where it really is like Superman challenges us to do things ourselves and to and, and inspires us by by not get interfering with certain things. In that way, exactly the same. There's a flaw, and there that's a wonderful flaw and a heroic flaw, but it, it leads to the to it opens the door for a kind of story that can really rock him to his core. So that we're, we're planning very very big stories. Hopefully that will you guys will like that will challenge the characters in a big physical way, but more importantly in an emotional and psychological way. Um, one of the things I think is interesting about you, you and Capullo on the book is that there's a lot of books out there and they're switching artists to keep up on time. But Capullo's doing—I mean, there's one fill-in, but it's—it's it's really like you two have owned an arc, you know, like have owned that run completely. Like, how important does it feel now, like, to keep that consistency for you? And I know that you have a really good relationship with him too. Yeah, it's—it's it's incredibly important because, honestly, the magic that I feel with Greg is something you don't find a lot of times. You know, I mean, I'm lucky in the way that I feel like I've cultivated really strong relationships with the artists I've worked with on my books, but with Greg, we didn't get along at first, you know, mm -hmm. he was like really protective of the art, and I was protective of the story, and then we just talked the story together, and since then, we like choose cons to go to that we can bring our wives to and hang out, like he's coming down, spoiler, for a bat dinner, even though he's not listed here, so that we can all go out as a group, you right. know, tomorrow, and and having somebody that you... It's not just having someone that you know so that you don't have to worry about getting to know somebody new, but having somebody who inspires you page by page so that it's not just his art. For example, like, <clears throat> on Joker, there's a scene coming up where I needed it to be, like, the most terrifying thing in the cave for, ba for Batman for a moment. And he was like, why don't we do it in this sort of an angle, these colors? And it makes me actually change the story to make those things happen. And that sort of collaboration where you feel like you're a co-creator on a book is so inspiring and wonderful that it's really important to me to keep that together. And we both feel that way. We're staying together for a long time. We're like, you know, twins at this point. It, it like, feels like there's that... And I'm the Danny DeVito of that group, I would suppose. <laughs> That's, you know, no, I think it's a little more parody. But um, it's, it's one of those things like when, when a creative team finds that click they find that groove and I feel like you're in that with like a bunch of different people so that, that's really interesting uh, thanks you know it, does it can you do you just feel that like and now it's just working it's going it's more yeah I effortless. do I mean I feel really lucky I'll say this like for people out there that are like you know starting out or, or, or you know just beginning relationships with artists it's really important to be able to let go a little bit you know and I had to learn that too and to be able to say to Jim on Superman you know what I want to do this this, this this scene where Superman is destroying this thing without giving anything away, like destroying something. Um, but I want him to be doing it in this different way. Can you think of something to do to visually represent how dwarfed he is by this situation? And the stuff Jim comes up with is amazing. It's like totally innovative. But you have to be able to say, you know better than me visually. I'm going to hand it over to you. 
you know, work your magic. And when you work with artists, you really are inspired by the, you, the thing that comes back is better than you could have done it yourself, you know? So, um, let's, let's switch over to the darker side, as if that's possible with you. Yeah. Uh, but at Vertigo, uh, you've got a new series coming out with, with Sean Murphy. He's coming off Punk Rock Jesus, and, and, and so it's, it's The Wake. Yeah. What is, what is The Wake? The Wake is something really different for me. It's like a, a 12 issue miniseries that we're doing. And the story structure is really different. Of course, your miniseries is 12 issues, know, and not right? four. Maxi series, yeah, <laughs> right. It's, um, well, it's a, it's a science fiction horror story, essentially, that begins with this discovery at the bottom of the ocean that has to do with human evolution. And, and, and so it's a really giant story in scope where the ramifications of this discovery are both terrifying in the immediate, but it has to do also with. Um, the the origin of all of these sea myths, sirens of, of ancient Greece and mermaids and uh, all of the kinds of things we associate with the sea being sort of discovered as part of this new mythology we realize is there. But it's it, it has two parts, and one is sort of post-apocalyptic and one is um, at the bottom of the ocean. And I knew Sean would be perfect for it. I mean, we're really good friends, but because one of the things that I think he's so good at with punk rock, which is just such a gem, and in and Survival of the Fittest is that he world builds, you know? So he's this guy, when you see these pages, you will feel trapped at the bottom of the ocean with a scary monster, you know what I mean? Like, you feel claustrophobically there having these nightmares, and I'm really excited for people to see it. I really, it's fun to go from, like, big mainstream bombastic superhero stuff where you pour your heart into the characters to, like, indie stuff where you can, you can flex your muscles in a different way and push and try things writing-wise that, you know, you might fall on your face and, and try and grow a little bit, you know? So, are you going to be able to put motorcycles in that? There are. There actually are going to be <laughs> motorcycles. In fact, I always ask him. I ask him, I'm like, Sean, I'm like, give me a few things you want to draw and I'll throw them. And it's always, like, castles, uh, motorcycles, <laughs> and it's, like, a laser beam and, uh, you know, a whale. I'm like, go. Let's do it. You know what I mean? I have my checklist. Everything else can work around it. It's good. So it's going to be good to wait. Now, 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 the other side of that is that is I, I heard some bad news. Not bad, but, you know, American Vampire, what's, what's going to happen? What's the deal? What's the plan? Well, the thing with American Vampire is this. Like, we're taking a hiatus, you know, creatively for about six months. The book will probably be on hi- hiatus in publication for a little bit under a year. But the idea with it really wasn't... It's not like we're taking a break because we are tired of it or anything like that. Raphael and I are going to do some really cool stuff in the DCU. He wanted to try to do some stuff outside of that uh, American Vampire. And we've always planned this arc, The Blacklist, as the, as the absolute half point of the series. So the series will actually make a big time jump after this. And we wanted it to feel organically like you were catching up with the characters after a long period of time, you know? Mm-hmm. So it worked out to be a perfect moment to take a break and actually to get far ahead. Mm-hmm. So we'll be way ahead on the book when we come back, and we're going to relaunch it, um, you know, I mean, restart it. Not restart the story, but, I mean, pick up where we left off in a really big way with a lot of push behind it for Vertigo, and hopefully we'll bring in new readers as well. So it's not going anywhere. We just wanted to kind of look away from it so when you look back, it feels like time has passed and your favorite characters will be in different places. And Raphael and I are both going to be doing some fun stuff, both in the DCU and independently together. So, and to make it clear, this is not one of those hiatuses that, look, we're going to take a hiatus, which oh, no. really means we're done. That's it's it's 100 percent on the schedule coming the, back. The month it's on the schedule. We have the ads for it coming. Everything it is back. It's literally we just wanted a few months off so that we could try a couple things together. And and I don't want to say what it is because sure. it's it's still it's still absolutely not fully confirmed. But it would be a lot of fun. It's in the DCU. It's with characters I love writing. And he wanted to try something like that. Um, and then right after that, we'll go back to American Vampire and we'll just get ahead. So it is absolutely not an indefinite hiatus. It is a very definite hiatus where we're not even taking a break in terms of working. Raphael is just going to do something else for a little bit that we're going to do together and then come right back to it. So, And it's good that you get to do that kind of stuff. That's really always fun. Yeah. Um, I guess finally, uh, we can talk about Swamp Thing. I think that's all of the million oh, yeah. things that you're doing. Yeah, I know, right? um, so what's, where, where are you with Swamp Thing, I guess? I well, mean, you, know, you don't have to tell me the story, but uh, No, well, I, I actually, I just went out with Jeff Lemire, who just got here. Um, I hear you guys are friends. Saying, we're rooming together, dude. <laughs> I'm so excited. I was like, we'll be roomies. Um, Anyway, uh, we're in the middle of this really big um, crossover we're doing called Rot World, where essentially the whole DCU has been taken over by the forces of decay. So you're going to see everybody from, like, Starro in my book to, like, Superman rotted out, you know, and Camo, Catwoman, everybody, just, like, anyone you could think of. So it's going to be the craziest 
like post-apocalyptic storyline we could possibly imagine. We really hope you guys like it, and it's also really going to change the status of both series. So when you get to the end of it, they're they're really big emotional hits. As zany and crazy as the series itself is, like it's very much about setting up the next year of Swamp Thing and Animal Man at the end. All right, well, I, I hope you're enjoying yourself with this thing because, uh, you know, all that praise and stuff that people are coming uh, at you is, is totally deserved. And uh, Thanks, this, is a, this is a nutty situation, but it's a good place to be in for you. Yeah, I feel really lucky. I mean, honestly, I, I wake up really happy to do this. My kid still thinks I, like, go to work and meet with Batman, and I'm like, today you're going to fight the Joker, you know what I mean? And Batman's sort of like, again, and I'm like, yes, Batman, again, you know, get over if, it. If I'm Batman, I'd be like, I really don't like this guy. He's he's know, really right? making things tough on me. I know, I feel, but Greg is always teasing me, he's like, I know deep down, you don't like him at all, dude, you hate him, <laughs> you hate Bruce. I'm like, yeah, no dude, way. that's the job, man. Yeah, you gotta, it's like the Joker says, man, you gotta put him through trial by fire to make him stronger. It only makes him a better hero, right? That's what I tell myself when I see Bruce, like, crushed beneath something horrifying, so yeah. But I'm, I'm very grateful for it, and, you know, you guys, the fans, everyone has been so supportive. I really appreciate it. I mean, I promise we're going to deliver, I really believe in my heart, we're going to deliver the best stuff we've done on all these books in 2013. I mean, on the ones I'm on, I really believe that. Hey, Connor, what's up? I don't think this is an iPad. It's not an iPad. That's a, that's a Seagate GoFlex satellite. It's not, so it's not an What does it do? You can put a bunch of media on it, movies, pictures, music, and you can stream them to your digital device. This has a Wi-Fi signal, sends it all out there. So if you have an iPad or an iPhone or, or lots of other devices, you put the Seagate app on there, and you can access all that media without filling up that device. And it's great for traveling or if you've got kids and you need to give them something to do or if you're at this convention and you, you just want to escape for a little while with a flick. So I can put a movie on here? You can put a lot of movies on there. That's a big old hard drive. What about drive. a song? Yes, yes, yeah. Can I put a movie and a song? You can, yes. Yeah, you definitely can do that. Where's the screen? That's going to be the other device. I see. So I put a movie or a song on here, and I do this, and I hear the movie or the song? Do you hear something right now? I hear the ocean. Yes, then that works for you. Uh, so where can I get this? You want to go to Seagate.com slash iFanboy. iFanboy viewers can get 10% off one of these or, or the other stuff going on. And, and these are really cool devices, very useful. And uh, once Connor figures out how to use it, you will also appreciate it. I don't it. have a pocket. Yeah, you have to you want to use one of your other pockets. Oh, it I have a pocket here. Pockets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it fits in my pocket. It does. It does. It's warm. 